Malam. Uh, good evening, brothers and sisters uh, in Indonesia and around the world. Selamat uh, malam, saudara-saudara di Indonesia dan di seluruh dunia. Uh, uh, for the time being, we are still admitting uh, the participants to uh, log in to this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, welcome to this webinar. Uh, we will start pretty soon. I would like to ask uh, Otniel to uh, share screen a slide. Thank you. Yeah, as we know, uh, you have been <clears throat> you have received uh, the flyers from Solar Scriptura with uh, the webinar uh, theme: Women and their role in the New Testament and now a biblical perspective with Professor uh, Ben with the Ben with the PhD. I'm being uh, participants uh, keeps participants keep logging in 180 almost 200 right now so we are still waiting for our brothers and sister uh, to uh, log in uh, to this webinar. Uh, uh, Otniel, could you uh, show the next slide, please? Uh, not, not this one. Uh, back, back one slide. Yeah. Uh, for those of you who do not know Sola Scriptura, uh, I'll inform you that Sola Scriptura uh, is annual lectures on biblical studies. Uh, is annual event in the form of seminar or lecture which is interdenominational and open for all Christian communities, Christian intellectuals, could be lecturers, seminary students, or other intellectuals, as well as pastors, uh, evangelists, and church leaders and activists. Sola Scriptura exists to support Christians in Indonesia to reach unity in their faith and the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of fullness of Christ so that Christians in Indonesia may no longer be infants, tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful seeming. Ephesians 4, 13 to 14. So let's get to that introduce you. Christians in Indonesia, Indonesia to the latest studies of the Bible from world-class biblical scholars in order to be able to critically review the credibility of various significant information about the Bible and its truth in social media. In this pandemic condition, Sola Scriptura is brought in webinar form targeted for the Christian lay people who have interests in biblical studies. Okay, uh, for the time being, almost 300. Uh, Otniel will play the song In Christ Alone and we'll be back. alone my hope is found he is my light my strength my song this cornerstone is solid ground firm through the fiercest drought and storm what heights of love what depths of peace when fears are still when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ. 
A beautiful song by Adam Troy and music by Kak Susi and Ari Purba. Notnya, would you mind sharing the screen again for slide number three? Uh, we're gonna have a quick survey, brothers and sisters. Uh, hold a second, yeah, this one, and Otniel will lead you guys for the quick survey. Uh, simple one, you just answer uh, in your on your screen. Uh, di mana lokasi anda? Where is your location? Whether you are in Western Indonesia, Central Indonesia, Eastern Indonesia, or overseas, All right? And then second one: uh, Have you participated in Sola Scriptura seminars before? Uh, have you participated or uh, not yet participated? And number three: Simple questions: uh, Do you know a lady named Joanna? in the Gospel of Luke. Do you know or you don't know? You just select uh, the answer. So while waiting uh, our brothers and sisters to be admitted to this webinar, it's over 230 right now, keep coming in. So would you mind uh, answering the quick survey of this? Yeah, while you are still answering uh, the quick survey, could you move the next slide, please? Uh, and then uh, probably during this one, uh, during this time, uh, you also could uh, make a greeting in the chat box and tell where you are so that we can greet each other uh, in Christ. Thank you. All right, uh, now stats, quick stats. You know, it's taken on December 3rd, 2020, which is yesterday, 5 p.m., 515 registrants. Uh, you can see that the pie chart, the simple pie chart, right? Uh, well, I would say uh, we discussed in the committee that uh, uh, the millennials, you know, if by definition, uh, uh, people who were born you know in 1980s right and above all right it occupies uh somewhere around two percent uh, plus 13 percent and 23 percent all right so it's good so we have uh, our webinar will be uh, watched by uh, the millennials and then quite interestingly 
you know, uh, for this uh, topic, uh, uh, the percentage of women, you know, uh, dominate uh, the men, you know. All right, next slide, uh, uh, Odniel. And then uh, while you keep uh, answering the survey, so this is gonna be our agenda, all right? Uh, we will have the participants logging, all right? And then uh, uh, we will have uh, uh, Dr. Ben Winterington uh, joining uh, pretty soon, all right? And then we're gonna hear, we're gonna listen to his lecture, women and their roles in New Testament and now a biblical perspective uh, uninterrupted for almost like 50 minutes. And then we're gonna have Q&A session and then we're gonna have information and closing prayer. Okay, all right. I'm gonna introduce to you our host and moderator tonight, Ms. Chakrita M. Saulina. She is a PhD candidate in theology and religious studies of New Testament, Faculty of Divinity, University of Cambridge. So now she is in Cambridge. Uh, Chucky, how are you? Hi. Hello, I'm good, Hello. thank you. Hi, uh, you are in Cambridge, UK, right? Yes, I am. I'm in Cambridge, uh, hey. England. Hi, right okay, now. there you are. You just activated your camera. So, uh, uh good what good afternoon or what to you uh afternoon yes good afternoon, afternoon. okay great so uh, nice seeing you all right so uh uh it's yours now as a host and moderator thank you thank you hello everyone good evening to all of you in southeast asia and good afternoon and morning to all of you in Europe and North America. My name is Chakrita and I will be your host today. A warm welcome to all of you to the second Sola Scriptura online lecture. To those who joined our first online seminar in September, welcome back to you all. And to those who are joining us today for the first time, we are excited to have you here with us. In order to help you fully engage and participate in this lecture, I would like to remind you of two things. First, if you want to raise your question, you can type it into the Q&A box or panel. As you can see on the slide, you can find this Q&A panel on the bottom of your Zoom screen next to the participant icon. You can submit your questions anytime during this lecture. And second, if you want to listen to the lecture in Indonesian, you can do that by clicking the interpretation panel. The icon is located to the far right at the bottom of your screen and you can choose Indonesian. Okay, and um, before we continue our seminar, let us pray. Gracious God, thank you for the time to learn from your words through today's lecture regarding women's role in this world. Thank you for all the devices and facilities that enable us to learn from one another, despite being apart physically at this time. May you bless Dr. Witherington and the material that he has prepared. May your words be proclaimed loudly and clearly, especially in this time when so many world views offer a distorted image of women and men in our society. Please grant each of us the clarity of mind and humility to listen to your words in this seminar so that we can see clearly once again our core identity as the image of God 
and how it is rooted in the gospel. And may you enable us to be the faithful witnesses of Christ Jesus in this world. Father in heaven, we lift up all elements of the le this lecture into your mighty hands. Let them be used for your glory. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. So for today's lecture, we will discuss an important and much debated issue of our times, especially in the light of the rise of feminist movements in the modern world, which is the roles of women in the society. Far before the rise of modern feminism, a first century Jewish rabbi from Galilee, Jesus of Nazareth, has taken a radical step in his relation to women and their involvement in his ministry, as written in the Gospels. This transformative attitude towards women can also be seen in the early church, as we can see in Pauline letters as well. Unfortunately, several verses taken from these letters have been used to limit the role of women in ministry or in a church for many, many years. Today in this lecture, we will look closely to what the Bible actually says about this very issue. The title of this lecture, The Women and Their Roles in the New Testament and Now, A Biblical Perspective. We will see a short video about what um, Professor Ben Witherington in relation uh, in uh, his short lecture about this topic. We're going to talk about women and their roles in the first century AD. There are really two things we need to talk about, women and their roles in the family and women and their roles in the ministry. We're going to talk about women and their roles in the family in the world of Jesus and Paul first. First thing you need to know about the context is all of these cultures that the New Testament talks about were patriarchal cultures. That is, they were male-dominated cultures. So the structures of society, the structure of marriage, the structure of property, everything was geared towards a male-centered kind of world. So when you're looking at the New Testament and what it says about uh, women and their roles in the family, what you need to look for is not primarily affirmations that women were part of a man's world only in a secondary set of roles. What you need to look for is trajectories of change and difference. Let's take an example. When we're talking about Jesus, for example, he holds up two models for his disciples as viable models to follow when it comes to marriage and family. On the one hand, he says, celibacy and singleness. He calls this being a eunuch for the sake of the kingdom. On the other hand, he says, fidelity in marriage with no divorce. Permanent marriage or being single for the sake of the kingdom. Those are the two options. Now, what's not surprising about that is that Jesus had a definite opinion on this. It was a very important topic in early Judaism. What is surprising about that is his exaltation of the viability of being a single person for the sake of the kingdom. And that's something pretty new, really, because most early Jews thought that that commandment back there in the Old Testament, be fruitful and multiply, it was a commandment on every able-bodied Jew, male and female. Now what that meant, if that was a commandment, was that women's roles were pretty much circumscribed to being mothers, to being wives, to working in the home or working in an agrarian setting that's connected to the home, but certainly not to have prominent religious roles. Women in early Judaism could be priests. We don't see them as rabbis. We don't see them as uh, teachers in various settings. Uh, they are pretty much confined to what we would call domestic roles. Enter Jesus. 
What Luke 8, 1 through 3 tells us about Jesus is simply this, that Jesus had traveling female disciples like Mary Magdalene, Joanna, the wife of Chusa, and Susanna, as well as male disciples. So what's new is not male disciples. What's new is female disciples. So far as I can tell, before Jesus, there is no evidence of women as disciples up to that point. And what is the effect of Jesus' teaching on marriage and divorce and singleness? The effect is this, twofold. Number one, it gives women far more security in their marriages because men can't just divorce them for various excuses or supposed causes. And secondly, the second thing is, is it allows women to remain single for the sake of the kingdom, like a Mary Magdalene. This is important because it means that roles outside of the home are clearly opened up to such women who are not simply a wife, not simply a daughter, not simply a mother, but something other or even more than that. You have to look at what is new in the teaching of Jesus in regard to these things. Well, what about when we get to Paul, what about the household codes where we hear a lot about um, submission and we hear about the husband and his headship and those kinds of things? Even there, you need to look at Colossians 3 and 4 and Ephesians 5 and 6 in light of the larger Pauline corpus and in light of the historical context. And when you do that, what you see is Paul dealing de facto with the existing patriarchal family and household structure and injecting into it the yeast of the gospel so that women are now allowed to have a variety of roles, do a variety of different things, not simply be mothers or wives again. So what's shocking and surprising in those household codes is not that there are places where Paul says, wives, submit to your husbands Christ, uh, as Christ uh, was a servant of the church. Now what's surprising about that is that he goes on to say, let's all submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. This idea of mutual submission is a novel thing, a new thing. And so what you need to look for when you're looking at the teaching about women and their roles in the family uh, is the new things that Jesus or Paul offered uh, in, the, in their teaching. And when you read the book of Acts, you can see the effect of the teaching in Jesus and Paul. You find women who are prophetesses. You find women who act like deaconesses. You have a woman in Romans 16, Phoebe, who's called a deacon. You have women who are teachers like Priscilla. So what you see is the opening up of a variety of roles for women within the household structure and also in the church as well. One last thing about women and their roles in the family. Jesus made clear there were these two options. What would happen if a husband died? Well, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, a woman is not obligated to remarry. She can remain single for the sake of Christ, or if she's going to remarry, she should remarry in the Lord, in the Lord. And Paul says, you know, some people have the grace gift, the charisma to remain single. Some have the grace gift to be married in the Lord. But either way, it should be done to the glory of God and for the good of the body of Christ. That's a very interesting teaching. One more thing that's really radical about Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 7. Paul says, the body of the husband belongs to the wife, just as the body of the wife belongs to the husband. Now what he's doing is balancing the scales and eliminating the sexual double standard. Because in the Greco-Roman world, women didn't need to, uh, men didn't need to be limited to just their spouse in the way they sexually express themselves. Paul's having none of that. He says, the woman has the right to say to the husband, this is what you can and can't do with your body. So what you see is Paul interacting with the existing structure of society and introducing the leaven of the gospel into the roles of women in the family. Yeah, well, I hope. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Ben. How are you, Chakrita? I'm good, thank you. And how about you? I'm fine. I am absolutely fine. I'm glad that we caught up with you. Yes. Uh, so, Ben, uh, before um, you start the lecture, I would just like uh, 
like a brief review about the, the participants questionnaire and I will introduce you and then right away you can start the lecture after those two things. Is that That's okay? Fine. I'm sure I'm going to uh, see if I can't adjust the light because it's very early here. Sure. Yeah. Take your time then. So yeah, um, earlier you have um, filled out the participant questionnaires and I would like just to review briefly about um, the result. The first is about your location and um, 77% participants are in Western Indonesia. Okay. And 9% is in the cent, uh, central Indonesia. And then 7%, uh, sorry, 7% is in uh, the Eastern part of Indonesia. And we also have participants from overseas, which is 6%. And the second question is about have you participate in Sola Scriptura seminars before? Uh, majority of the participants say yes. And uh, the rest of them is just 44%. Um, this is the first time for them. And the third one, um, this is interesting. Um, do you know a lady named Joanna in the Gospel of Luke? And 54% uh, say yes, that's a good thing. And uh, although 47% don't know, so hopefully through the seminar, you will learn more about her. And yes, that's the review of the questionnaire. So it is both an honor and pleasure for me to introduce our speaker, Professor Ben Witherington III. He is the Amos Professor of New Testament for doctoral studies at Asbury Theological Seminary in the United States and on the doctoral faculty at St. Andrews University in Scotland. He graduated from the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, with a bachelor's in English with a minor in philosophy and religion. He went on to complete his Master of Divinity degree from Gordon Conwell Seminary in Massachusetts, USA, graduating with summa cum laude. He received his PhD degree in theology with New Testament concentration from the University of Durham in England. He is now considered as one of the top evangelical scholars in the world and is an elected member of the prestigious Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas or SNTS, a society dedicated to New Testament studies. Dr. Witherington is a very prolific author, having written over 50 books and numerous articles including the Jesus Quest and the Paul Quest, both of which were selected by Christianity Today as top biblical studies works. Pertinent to our topic today, he has also written several books and journal articles regarding women in New Testament and the early church. So our topic today is certainly one of his expertise. His scholarly works and contributions to Christian ministry is widely known internationally. Professor Witherington has presented seminars for churches, colleges, and biblical meetings, not only in the United States, but also in England, Estonia, Russia, Europe, South Africa, Zimbabwe, Australia, and of course in Indonesia. Some of you might remember that Dr. Witherington came to Indonesia in 2008 as the speaker for Sola Scriptura annual lecture regarding the secret gospels and Jesus's inner circles. So Dr. Witherington, thank you very much for being with us today. And we are keen to learn from you. Without further ado, now the stage is yours. Thank you, thank you very much. 
Just a little more background. I did my doctoral work at the University of Durham in England on women in the New Testament. So I've been at this for a very long time, all the way back to 1977 BC, before cell phone, before computer. And uh, that resulted in three books on this subject, Women in the Ministry of Jesus, Women in the Earliest Churches, and Women in the Genesis of Christianity, and all three of them published by Cambridge University Press. So I've had the time to reflect and think about these issues for a very long time. And the place I really want to start the lecture today is uh, actually with the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of the fall. Because a lot of the problems in reading what's going on in the New Testament uh, really go back to certain assumptions about creation of men and women and, and the fall, and, and often false assumptions about these things. So let's start with the doctrine of creation. If you read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, which encompasses that whole subject, there are two creation narratives, the first of which tells us that men and women were the last and greatest of God's creation, uh, created in God's image. But when you turn to Genesis 2, uh, this is more specifically focused on not all of creation, but just the creation of human beings. And we hear the story of, of Adam from Adama, which basically is not a name in Genesis 2. It doesn't become a name till later. It just means the earth creature because he's made out of the dust of the earth. And woman is made out of man himself. So when we're talking about issues of origins and focusing on Genesis 2 and come to a text like 1 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, God the Father is the source of the Son, and the Son is the source of the man, and the man is the source of the woman, we need to understand that the word kephale in 1 Corinthians 11 is not about headship. It's about source. Where did they come from? And um, what was their purpose? So Genesis 2 not only tells us that woman came from man, it, it tells us as well that it was not good for man to be alone. Man had a need for a woman. Interestingly, what the text doesn't say is it's not good for a woman to be alone. I'll let you think about that for a minute. So man had a need for woman, not least because the propagation of the species couldn't happen otherwise. There needed to be male and female uh, sharing a one flesh union to fulfilled the commandment to be fruitful and multiply. But there are several other aspects of this that we need to take into account. Firstly, there is that famous phrase in the Hebrew that says that, and the woman will be a suitable companion to the man or even a suitable helper. Now, sometimes in Christian exegesis over the many centuries, that phrase has been taken to imply some subordination. But in fact, it does not, because the word helper there is the very word used of Yahweh or God as the helper of Israel. So it doesn't imply any subordination at all. Yahweh clearly not subordinate to his people, Israel. No, he's just their helper. And so there are no, is no implication of subordination of the woman to the man in that second creation narrative in Genesis 2. That comes later with the fall. And that brings us to Genesis 3. In Genesis 3, you will remember that there has been a sin by both Eve and Adam, and both are per, uh, punished for this sin by way of what is called a curse. Uh, the curse on the man is actually a curse on the ground, so there's going to be labor pains in producing a crop or supporting one's family. Uh, the curse on the woman is actually twofold. There is the labor pains she will have, the danger she will have in producing children. But there's also this sentence, which is critical, which says, and your desire will be for your husband and he will lord it over you. 
Now, this is not the original blessing. This is not an endorsement from all of creation of the subordination of women to men. This is the curse. The curse going forward after the fall is that men will try to dominate women. And so it's not an accident that it's only after that point in the narrative that we have patriarchs and patriarchy. So this whole business of patriarchy and whether or not that's God's original plan for humankind it is something we need to take into account because of course, the whole rest of the Old Testament and into the New Testament, there is a patriarchal society. There are, it is male dominated societies, one after another in the ancient Near East and also in the Greco-Roman world. Now that doesn't mean women couldn't play a variety of roles, but basically it was expected in all of these societies that women would be subordinate to men. I will say again to you, this is not God's original creation design. There was supposed to be mutuality equally created in the image of God between men and women. But the effect of the curse and the fall on human relationships is your desire will be for your husband and he will lord it over you. Interestingly, the Greek translation of that Hebrew verse is even clearer. In, in the Greek, uh, the word kurios is used, Lord, uh, to, uh, to explain the relationship that's going to happen as a result of the curse between men and women. Now that's the background I want you to understand. Uh, the, the Bible is not endorsing patriarchy in the Old Testament or for that matter in the New Testament. What in fact it's trying to do is ameliorate the effects of human fallenness on human society in the context of God's people. So when you turn the page to the New Testament and you get to, for example, the household codes, what we see there needs to be compared in context to household codes in the Greco-Roman world. You can't just read the Bible and then draw conclusions without understanding the context. I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. And if in fact you study Colossians 3 and 4 and Ephesians 5 and 6 in the context of the patriarchal world of the Greco-Roman world, what you will find out is that Paul is changing the structure of the family within the context of the household church. That's what's going on. He's not simply endorsing the existing patriarchy and calling it good. In fact, he's trying to change it from inside the context of the Christian family. One of the places this is most evident is, well, two places I'll mention. Uh, Ephesians 5.21. In Ephesians 5.21, Paul says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That is men submitting to women and women submitting to men. That's exactly what Ephesians 5.21 says, mutual submission. Sorry, sorry, professor. Uh, the committee would like to request you, sorry, very sorry. Uh, could you uh, take off your backdrop, sorry? I can't do that. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. All right. Yeah. yeah. I realize it's distracting because it, it's very early in the morning. It'll get better, but uh, okay. there's nothing I can do about that. And I'm sorry about that. Yeah. But in also, any case, in any case, I'll carry on. Sorry. Uh, could you also speak in the lower face? Because there is a live translation to Indonesian in the background. Thank you. Oh, okay. Sure. I'm happy to do that. So in Ephesians 5.21, it says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That's mutual submission of men to women and women to men. It's not unilateral submission of women to men. And then Paul illustrates that in the following verse. In fact, if you know the Greek, you discover that Ephesians 5.22 has no verb. So whatever submission 
hypotasso means in Ephesians 5.21 is also what it means in 5.22 when it says wives to husbands. The Greek simply says wives to husbands as to the Lord. And then it turns around and says, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. Now, if you know anything about love, and especially Christ's self-sacrificial love, if you know anything about that at all, you know that that involves submission. So both the husband and the wife are called to mutual submission uh, in various forms. Now that's just one illustration I could make of the many changes Paul is making to the household structure. One other that I can point out to you, which is important, is that if you look at the household codes in the Greco-Roman world, or even in early Judaism as well, uh, there's no mutuality. Basically, the household codes in the Greco-Roman world are telling the head of the household, the man, how to keep his slaves subordinate, how to keep his children obedient, and how to keep his wife in line. This is not what's going on in the household codes in the New Testament in Colossians 3 and 4 and Ephesians 5 and 6. Both children and slaves and wives are addressed as moral agents, as real people. And as such, they're expected to voluntarily do what is asked of them when they are commanded to do this, that, or the other. One other little interesting bit. Yeah, I, we recently had a student here who's done his doctoral dissertation on the exhortations to slaves in Colossians 3 and 4 and Ephesians 5 and 6. And one of the things that he has uh, proved beyond my personal doubt is that the word isotase used in Colossians means equality. So Paul is actually saying, masters, your slaves are your equals in Christ, and you need to treat them as full persons, not as property. You need to treat them as you would be treated. In fact, Paul says, you need to serve them as they are serving you. Now, that's just an illustration of what's going on in these household codes. But what's important about this is, is this, that Paul is changing the existing structure of patriarchy from within the context of the Christian family, because that's the only place he has any control. So that's what's going on. One more thing about that whole side of this, this discussion. Obviously, there are roles in the physical family that are uh, gender specific. As much as I might like to have borne one of our children and taken the burden off my wife, I just don't have the equipment to do that. So my wife bore both of our children. Obviously, in the physical family, there are some gender specific roles. That's really not the issue we're discussing this morning. That, that's just a fact. But what is not a fact is that those roles <clears throat> in the physical family should dictate how we have roles in the church. Roles in the church are not determined by gender. They are determined by who is called and who is gifted and who is, uh, if you will, graced to do this role or that role or the other role. That's, that's the facts. That's the truth of this particular matter. And so when we begin to look at women and their roles in the Gospels and Acts and in the rest of the New Testament, we need to bear in mind that what determined those roles was whom had been called and gifted to do these particular roles, and it involved both men and women. So let's talk about Jesus just for a minute, if we can. Jesus, so far as I can see, is the very first Jewish teacher to have not only male disciples, but female disciples. 
And I would encourage you to go back and read Luke 8, 1 through 3. And here we hear about Mary Magdalene and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Susanna, and other women who are, in fact, traveling disciples with the 12 and with Jesus. Now, in that context, that would surely have been seen as scandalous. These societies are very conservative in general in regard to the role of women. And so uh, you need to understand that Jesus is doing something radical here in regard to the role of women. Women could be full-fledged disciples and followers of Jesus and even travel around with men they were not related to, were not married to. The most interesting one of these women, well, two really, is of course Mary Magdalene, whose real name is Miriam from Migdal. Uh, her last name is not Magdalene, that's just an anglicized form uh, explaining where she came from, a little fishing village on the northwest coast of the Sea of Galilee. She's Miriam from Migdal. And then there's Joanna, the wife of Chusa. Now she's a high status woman. Uh, her husband is the estate agent for Herod Antipas in Galilee, the ruler of Galilee. This is important. So when we hear that these women were providing for this traveling band of disciples in Jesus when they were on the road, going around and uh, sharing the good news about the coming of the kingdom of God, uh, we need to understand that from the outset, women had roles, important roles, in, in the ministry of Jesus and supporting what was going on. If we carry on and read uh, the end of Luke's gospel in Luke 23 and 24, you will discover that Joanna was one of those women who was last at the cross, first at the empty tomb, and along with Mary Magdalene, one of the first women to see the risen Lord before any of the 12 did. Not only that, if you compare John 20, John 20 tells us that Jesus commissioned the women to go give the Easter message to the men who were locked behind closed doors for fear of the Jewish authorities. So not only were women allowed to be traveling disciples of Jesus, According to John 20, these women were commissioned, and you can compare Matthew 28, 9, and 10 as well, to proclaim the Easter message to the men. I'm going to say that again. Jesus himself commissioned women to go and proclaim that he is alive and has risen from the dead to the men. Now, what Luke 24 also tells us is that they were to tell that the tomb was empty and that they had seen angels. And in Luke's telling of the story, he adds that the men thought this was women's fantasies. This is not entirely a surprise, although these same men had known that Jesus had women disciples for several years during his public ministry. Not entirely a surprise, but, but nonetheless, it's inexcusable because Jesus had picked both male and female disciples to proclaim his good news. Now, if you fast forward to Pentecost, you will remember that Peter gives a speech based on the prophecy in Joel chapter two, that says that the Holy Spirit will fall not just on men or male leaders, but on men and women, even the maid servants and the men servants amongst the, that part of society will receive the Holy Spirit to proclaim the good news of the coming of the kingdom of God. So not only is it true that both men and women were commissioned to go and proclaim the good news, it is also true that they were equipped to do so by the falling of the Holy Spirit on all the disciples in the upper room. If you read Acts 1.14, what Acts 1.14 says is that in the upper room, you've got both men and women, including the mother of Jesus. She specifically mentioned, and the brothers of Jesus there, waiting to receive 
the, the endowment of the Holy Spirit so that they could go out and share the good news. Now that's the background for what we see in the rest of the book of Acts. In the book of Acts, we will see women doing the following roles. We will see women like Tabitha, who are pro providing practical service to the church by making garments. We will see women like Priscilla, who with her husband Aquila are, are teachers, even teaching a, a very famous early Jewish Christian uh, disciple named Apollos. More accurately, the way of the Lord, go back and read Acts 18, 24 to 26, which will tell that story. We hear about Philip's prophesying daughters as well. It, it's very clear, even just from a reading of Acts, that women played a variety of roles in the early church. And those roles were determined by who was gifted and who was graced to do which role. Now let's turn to Paul because always this discussion devolves to a discussion of what Paul says about these matters. And I want to go quite directly to Romans 16 because it's just loaded with information about women and their roles in the Pauline house churches. Point number one, we are immediately introduced to Phoebe. Who's Phoebe? Well, she's the hostess of a house church where apparently Paul has been saying in Kinkrie, which is the eastern seaport of the city of Corinth. And not only is she called by Paul, my personal patroness, that's the person who supported his ministry financially and otherwise, but she is labeled a deacon, not a deaconess, a deacon. In fact, chronologically speaking, she is the very first person in the whole Bible called a deacon as a religious role. Now, it, it, the text unfortunately doesn't unpack all of the responsibilities she had, but if you read several Romans commentaries, most of these commentaries will tell you that the reason Paul is introducing Phoebe to the Romans uh, the Roman Christians, largely Gentiles, is because she is the letter bearer. He's commending her to them because she's going to travel from, from Corinth to Rome with Paul's letters to the Romans. And what we know for a fact is that people who carried Paul's letters to various churches, whether a Timothy or a Titus or a Phoebe, were expected to read out those letters and explain them. So interestingly, Phoebe is commended to the church in Rome and asked to support her ministry. And presumably she is the person who took this letter to the Romans, to Rome, and read it out and explained it to people. That in itself is worth a lot. But further down, we hear about Pete, Paul's ongoing co-workers, Priscilla and Aquila. Interesting fast fact, in a patriarchal culture, normally the husband is always mentioned before the wife. But in all cases except one in the New Testament, Priscilla is mentioned first before Aquila when talking about these Pauline co-workers who worked with Paul in Corinth and in Ephesus and then went on to Rome because they originally came from Rome, according to Acts 18. They are clearly very important co-workers of Paul. So we need to think seriously about what roles they played. Well, we already know from Acts 18 that they were teachers. They were teachers even of leading Christians like Apollos. Go back again and read Acts 18, 24 to 26. Furthermore, and importantly, furthermore, a little further down in the list, we hear about Andronicus and Junia. Now, this, like Priscilla and Aquila, is surely a husband and wife ministry team. And uh, just to be clear, there is no male name Junias in the Greco-Roman world. You, you don't name your son 
uh, after the name of a female deity, namely the god Junia. Okay, so it's very clear that Junia is a woman and connected to Andronicus. Now, what does Paul tell us about this woman? Well, he says that both her and her husband Andronicus were in Christ before me. Now, that's a very important statement because Paul was converted on Damascus Road within two or three years of the death of Jesus, so somewhere in the mid-30s AD, okay? And yet Andronicus and Junia were already in Christ before then. Now, what that means is, since the Gentile mission had not really begun, is that Andronicus and Junia are uh, within the circle of the earliest Jewish Christians in Judea and in particular in Jerusalem. Who could these people be? Well, here's where I tell you that Junia is simply the Latin form of the name Joanna. We already talked about her. Interestingly, there are only two persons for whom we have a story of them being disciples of Jesus and then carrying on with ministry into the early church that is anything like a full story. Those two people are Peter and Joanna slash Junia. Paul also says about Junia, not only that she was in Christ before me, but that she had been in jail, incarcerated with Paul. Now, if you're a student of ancient Roman law, you will know that women hardly ever were thrown in jail. Almost never. They would have had to do something big, annoying, or illegal in public to get thrown in jail. The fact that we are told that they were fellow prisoners of Paul indicates that she was a person who had done something like publicly proclaiming the gospel along with Paul and Andronicus, and this got them in trouble. Then finally, and most importantly about that little bit, Paul says they are noteworthy among the apostles. I'm going to let that sink in for a second. They are noteworthy among the apostles. The Greek does not say notable to the apostles or noted by the apostles. It says noteworthy among the apostles. And the only really proper reading of that Greek sentence is that they are apostles. Both Junia and Andronicus are apostles. Now, if you ask the question, what does the word apostle mean to Paul, all you have to do is turn to 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 2, where Paul says, am I not an apostle? Have I not seen the risen Lord? For Paul, especially in 1 Corinthians 15, the criteria for being an apostle with a capital A is having seen the risen Lord. This connects the dots of the story. This means that Junia slash Joanna was one of those who had seen the risen Lord within the 40-day period in which he appeared. She was one of those who were originally commissioned by the Lord to go and share the good news, the Easter message with various people. Now I could go on down that path showing you other women that Paul worked with. There are various of them mentioned in, in Romans 16. But that is the proper context for turning to texts like 1 Corinthians 14 or 1 Corinthians 11 or 1 Timothy 2. In those texts, Paul is uh, dealing with some problems. So let's deal with 1 Corinthians 11 just briefly first. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says that it's okay for women to pray and prophesy in the worship service as long as they wear a head covering. Now, we can have a long talk about that. Uh, in fact, it was normally Jewish men who wore head coverings. 
We call them yarmulkes today, the little beanie caps, if you will. But, but in fact, Paul is saying they need authorization upon their head. Now, this is rather like a clerical collar. It's, it's not a sign of subordination to men. It's a sign that they have been authorized to speak because there would be Jewish Christians that would object to that because of their traditional way of, of being in society in that society. So he says, if they have authority down from their head, that's what the Greek literally says. He's not talking about a veil on, in front of the face. He's talking about a head covering. Then they can pray and prophesy in the worship service. So it's clear from 1 Corinthians 11 that Paul is not forbidding women to speak or even to use uh, inspired speech in the worship service. Clearly, he's not prohibiting that. So whatever 1 Corinthians 14, 33b to 36 means, it's not a full prohibition of women speaking in church. So let's deal with 1 Corinthians 14, 33b to 36 now. Paul says, as in all the churches, I want women to be silent. And you have to ask the question, silent when? You have to read the first portion of 1 Corinthians 14 to understand this commandment. He's talking about the time when the prophets were speaking. He's talking about the time when the prophets were speaking in the worship service. Everybody else, including in this case, women, were to be silent during that time and listen. Now, why might women be speaking during that time? Well, now you need to know something about Greco-Roman prophecy, which is a consulting service. If you were to go to the oracle at Delphi in the Greco-Roman world, you went with questions. You went to ask the oracle, should I marry this man? Should I buy this property? Should I, should I go to war against these people? Should I take this official office or not? In the Greco-Roman world, prophets or prophetesses served the, the, the purpose of consultation. You were supposed to come with questions for them. So when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 14, 33b to 36, if you have any questions, ask the man at home, He's simply ruling out asking questions of the prophets in the Christian worship service because Christian prophecy was not like Greco-Roman prophecy. It was not a consulting service. Prophecy in the Old Testament and in the New Testament is a top-down thing. God gives a message to a prophet and he is supposed to share it with the people and they're supposed to listen quietly and receive the message. Well, apparently that's not what was happening. There were some Gentile women who had a background knowing what prophecy was like in Corinth, and they were asking questions. Paul says, nope, don't do that in the worship service. Don't interrupt. Uh, if you have questions, wait and ask at home. But what about 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15? Now, I, I would say to you that I have uh, put up on my blog, which is on the Patheos website, uh, the blog Bible and Culture, today, the way uh, N.T. Wright discusses this issue. And before that, I had already put up how Gary Hogue and Tom Wright had discussed these issues. 1 Timothy 2, 8 through 15, is a corrective passage, just like 1 Corinthians 14, 33b to 30. Six. That is, he's correcting a problem. He's not laying down a principle in all and every kind of circumstances. He's correcting a problem. And that becomes clear if you back up and read the whole of 1 Timothy 2. In the first place, he corrects the men. He says, I want men to lift up holy hands without grumbling in prayer. So he corrects the men, the grumbling men first, and then he's going to correct some high status women. He says, I want women to uh, dress modestly without a lot of jewelry 
uh, and, and I want them to be quiet. Now, the word here in the Greek is hesukia, a different word than the word for silence, sagao, in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul says, I want them to be quiet, to listen, and to learn. And then he says, I am not now permitting these high status women to uh, teach or to usurp authority over the male teachers like Timothy or Titus in this case. Again, he's correcting a problem. So the question you have to ask about that passage is, why would high status women in Ephesus assume that they could immediately be involved in teaching or religious roles in the Christian house church? And the answer is straightforward. In Ephesus, there is the cult of Artemis. This is a cult whose religious functions were entirely performed by women. It was women who taught people about the goddess Artemis. It was women who ran the sacrificial rites there. It was women who prayed and prophesied out of the temple of Artemis in Ephesus. So what's happened here? Well, Paul and others have converted some women, some high status women in Ephesus during the two and a half years Paul and his co-workers Priscilla and Aquila were there. And not surprisingly, these high status literate women who had substantial financial resources simply assumed that they would continue to play the same kind of religious roles in the church that they had played in the Greco-Roman cult of Artemis or elsewhere. And Paul is saying, first you must listen and learn, then thereafter you uh, may assume other roles. Now, when Paul in the Greek says, I am not now permitting, not now permitting women to teach or to assume authority over men, this does not mean that he would never do so. He's simply saying that they need to be subordinate to the teaching, listen to the teaching, and listen and learn before they perform other roles. And of course, that's good advice for any disciples. They were jumping the gun. They were getting ahead of where they were in the process of learning how to be good disciples of Jesus. They were new converts, and but they had simply brought their assumptions about religious roles into the church from their practice in religion elsewhere in Ephesus in that time. The last thing I want to say, and then we're going to have some time for some questions, is um, if you look at the uh, teachings in the pastoral epistles about uh, elders and deacons, and also, by the way, deaconesses, uh, I, don't, I don't think that there's an exhortation for the wives of deacons that you don't have for the wives of elders. So I think we do have evidence in the pastoral epistles talking about uh, male elders, uh, male deacons and female deacons like Phoebe. But if you were looking at that advice given to a person like Titus, whether you're looking at the letter to Titus or you're looking at 1 Timothy, what you need to keep in mind again and again and again is that Paul is a smart pastor. He begins with the culture where he finds it. And what is the culture like? It's a male dominated culture. So the first advice he gives to missionaries starting a new mission on the island of Crete or in Ephesus or anywhere else is start with the structure of the society as you find it and then change it in the context of the house church. So not surprisingly, the advice given in the pastoral epistles is for the first task is that when you have some male converts say on Crete, that Titus should set them up as the elders leading those initial house churches. You start with the society where it is with male leadership. You work your way to a place where both men and women equally can play roles in the church, religious roles in the church. And lastly, I would remind you that Paul says that in Christ, there is no 
Jew or Gentile. There is no slave or free. There is no male and female distinctions dictating all the roles in the church because we're all one in Christ. Men and women working together, equally created in the image of God, equally renewed in, in the image of Christ and serving the Lord. That's the big picture from creation to fall to the beginnings of the process of redemption in the New Testament. And that's the context in which we ought to interpret the roles of women in ministry in the New Testament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Witherington. So I get the honor to uh, first just to summarize what you have just said. Um, you, you highlight uh, the importance of seeing the bigger picture from the Genesis until um, the New Testament about how we should see the role of women in, in the Bible, basically, because um, if we take a closer look in the creation uh, story, certainly uh, patriarchal is not part of God's intention when God's created women and men. And the subordinations and domination of men started after the fall. And then you also mentioned that Jesus basically is a very radical rabbi in terms of how he treated uh, women as he also includes uh, men and women in his um, circles of disciples. And then as we can see in the gospels, uh, we can see like uh, Joanna and Mary, Miriam of Magdala um, as um, two um, female uh, figures that are prominent in the gospel. And um, when we take a look in um, in Acts, we can also see how the Holy Spirit's equipped women and men uh, in order that they can uh, be the faithful witnesses of Christ. And uh, basically, the gift of the Holy Spirit is basically the, um, the most important um, uh, determinator to, to the role that we have in society, basically. If we gift it for something, and that we should do it, and not the the physical gender, basically. And also, um, in Paul's letters, especially, we can also see Joanna um, once again mentioned as um, a figure that prominent among the disciples, among the apostles, even um, with his husband Andronicus. In uh, Peter and Joanna is the two important figures that we can see starting starting from Jesus' ministry and then uh, the death of Christ and even until the resurrections and the early church. And you also mentioned that is it important to see um, the passages in first passages in the Pauline letters such as the first Corinthians or first Timothy about women could not uh, uh, women have to be silenced in this bigger framework, basically. And then uh, those passages is usually put in the corrective passages. So I also got the um, honor to, um, to give the first response to you, uh, Dr. Witherington, um, and to try to contextualize it in um, Indonesian uh, lens, basically. Um, so there are two issues that I would like to raise um, in connection to Indonesian context, but these two problems, in my view, come from one source of problem, and you already mentioned that uh, earlier. Uh, first, the role of women in Indonesia, in either a church setting or the society at large, is shaped by the Indonesian culture. Indonesian culture itself has its dis distinctive characteristics due to its plurality. Indonesia has more than a thousand tribes, each of them having their own traditions and cultures. The majority of them, however, I could say are patriarchal. 
This distinctiveness can also be observed in many churches in Indonesia, particularly churches catering to specific ethnicities or tribes in Indonesia. The spirit of these churches is certainly for contextualizations of Christian ministry, mm. reaching out to this specific group of people. In these tribal uh, churches, or even the non-tribal churches, many cultural values and traditions, including a patriarchal principle, are part of the life of the churches. For many Christians, men and husbands are the head of the household, we already mentioned several passages about women's subordinations, such as in Ephesians 5, Colossians 6. Um, so consciously or unconsciously, these household codes are transferred into the church and yeah. even in the society at large. Yeah. In a church setting, for instance, women are encouraged to do tasks of serving such as dealing with visitation, providing refreshment or church decoration. Whereas men have the heavy task of ruling, for example, such as the elders. So the same household codes, um, also along with the passages that you mentioned earlier, like First Timothy, are also used by certain denominations to exclude women from the pulpit, which is the second issue that I want to raise. Strikingly, in Indonesia, although some churches still forbid women to preach in the pulpit, many denominations have ordained women since as early as the 1950s. So in comparison to the Western world, the issues of women in the pulpit may not be as hot or as debated as in the Western world. Interestingly, I mean, like uh, contrasting that to the patriarchal culture that dominates the country. So come back to my um, questions. The Bible verses regarding household codes, highlighting the subordinations of women to men um, is basically in my view is the bigger problem. So what should we should be aware of uh, when we see these household codes in the Bible? Are these values transferable or not to other settings? If not, what are the things that the church should do to prevent any misreading of the Bible verses highlighting these quotes? Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Those are just excellent questions, and I appreciate that. The first thing I would say is a word of encouragement, which is that Paul's world was even more patriarchal than Indonesia. He was starting with an even more patriarchal world than Indonesia is today. So the good news is if Paul thought he could reform society within the context of the household church and not simply baptize the general patriarchal culture and call it good, then we should be able to do that as well. Because of course it's the same Christ and the same Holy Spirit and the same Heavenly Father working in the church today as then. The second thing is that, you know, um, out of love and respect, of course, we start with cultures or individual tribes or groups where they are, not where we would like them to be. And what you see in the household codes in Colossians 3 and 4 and 5 and 6 it is a trajectory of change towards a more equalitarian way of looking at the roles of women and men. And those household codes should not be uh, viewed as simply an endorsement of the existing patriarchal society. No, Paul is working for change in the one place where change can happen by the grace of God and by the work of the Holy Spirit within the household because of course the early church met entirely in households. So you have to be able to recognize the trajectory of change that's going on in, in those household codes. Yes, they reflect patriarchal society, but the question is where is this argument going? What's the trajectory that this is going towards? Well, it's going towards Galatians 3.28 in Christ, 
those things shouldn't be the determining factors of roles in the family, in, in, the, in the church, in the family of faith, not particularly in the physical family. So I would simply say that within the existing structure of society, within the church where you have some say, you work for change towards a more egalitarian or equalitarian view of the role of men and women, both in the family and in the church. And I think Paul is already doing that. And in the video that you were showing when I came on, uh, the seven minute seminary that I had done, and one of the things I stressed is, notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7. He says something radical for that society. He says that the body of the husband belongs to the wife. Now that's unheard of. Yes, the body of the wife belongs to the husband. But in a Greco-Roman society, nobody was saying the body of the husband belongs to the wife. She has an exclusive right to it. No, there was a double sexual standard in that culture. It was all right for men to go visit prostitutes and play around, not okay for the wife to ever do that. So what Paul is doing, if you will, is he's leveling the playing field and applying the same sexual standards to men as to women. He's changing the way they look at marriage within the context of a Christian marriage. So it, you need to be able to see the trajectory of change in Colossians 3 and 4 and Ephesians 5 and 6 and not assume on face value that he's simply endorsing the patriarchal structure and considering it good. No, he's working to change it. And there are reasons to think that he did so when you read a text like Romans 16, which tells us that women were playing all kinds of roles in both the family and in the church. Thank you very much for that. Uh, in connection uh, with my previous question, there's uh, someone also asked from Lena Link. Uh, she says, reform theology doesn't allow women to be ordained as minister based on 1 Corinthians 14, 34. What do you think? Is this the right interpretation since this will against the God's concept of equality that you mentioned? Thank you. Yeah, now, I would say no, it's not at all the right interpretation. Paul has a very limited prohibition of women speaking when prophets were prophesying during the worship service. And you know what? I've never been in a Reformed church where prophets were prophesying. <laughs> never, mm -hmm. not once. I've spoken in a lot of Reformed and Presbyterian churches. And furthermore, that text has nothing to do with ordination. Nothing at all. Ordination's not even mentioned in that text. It's talking about when you should be quiet and when you should be silent when somebody else is speaking an inspired word of God. I mean, the modern application would be, if the preacher's preaching, you don't stand up in the middle of the sermon and object. That, that would be wrong. That would be a misuse of your privilege of later asking questions. So I don't think 1 Corinthians 14, uh, 33b through 36 has anything to do with the ordination of women or men, for that matter. I don't think it has anything to do with that. And I will say that there are Reformed churches uh, some Presbyterian churches, like the Presbyterian Church of America, uh, that, that does ordain women. So mm -hmm. this is not a universal even uh, practice, even within the Reformed Church. There, in Australia, the, the Reformed churches have women ministers as well. So uh, it, it, it's a mixed phenomenon on a worldwide scale. Got it, yeah. So the next question is from Johan Setiawan, what is your opinion about the complementarian position, once again related to that, uh, positions of many respected evangelical theologians about biblical manhood and womanhood? What do you consider as their strongest argument for complementarianism? Yeah, well, here is here again, what's being confused is roles in the physical family and roles in the church. Obviously, there are some gender specific roles in the physical family. Obviously. <laughs> I mean, that's just undeniable. Men and women are not the same, physically speaking. 
So not a surprise, men and women don't have exactly the same roles in the physical family. So in that sense, male and female are not duplicates of one another, but complements of one another. I mean, I think that argument it would hold, but to unless you take a very Gnostic view of human nature and say, no, what we are physically doesn't matter at all. So I, I think that argument holds, but the implication of that is not, that then determines what roles you can play in the church. No, what determines what roles you can play in the church it is who's called, who's gifted, who has the Holy Spirit gifts to do what role. And that's not a gender, uh, the Holy Spirit is an equal opportunity employer of both men and women to share the gospel. Thank you. And the next question is from uh, Dr. Yonke Karman. He said, he refers to first, Timothy, when Paul says Adam would not deceive, but the woman was deceived and become a transgressor, was he still not able to free himself from Jewish teaching such as found in Jesus Ben Sirach? He, he quoting Jesus, uh, Sirach 25 to 24, for a woman's sin had its beginning and because of her, we all die. So what is your positions on women's liberty and feminist theology? Oh, that's the first question. The second question is, what is your positions on women's liberty, as such as a feminist theology? And then the third one is, my question is about um, the idea of women as the source of evil as delineated by Sirach and someone somewhat reflected in 1 Timothy 2.14. Yeah, I don't, uh, first of all, uh, I think Jesus Ben Sirach is, is absolutely a male chauvinist, no mm -hmm. question. <laughs> And I would not put Paul in the same camp as Jesus Ben Sira at all. Uh, his approach is very different. Now, if you look at what Paul says about Adam in Romans 5 and also in 1 Corinthians 15, it's very clear that he is mainly blaming Adam for the fall. He is not mainly blaming the woman for the fall. And, and here's the interesting thing, that verb deceive in 1 Timothy 2. It means a person who has not been fully instructed and is capable of making a, a good decision, capable mm -hmm. of being deceived. Now, if you go back to Genesis 2, to whom was the commandment given to not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? It was given to Adam. And whose job was it to instruct Eve about how properly to relate to the tree. That was Adam's job. He got the instruction in the first place. And when Eve goes to the tree, it's clear she's not been properly instructed because she even adds something to the prohibition. She says, we're not even supposed to touch it. This means that Adam had not properly instructed her in the first place. And so she was capable of being deceived. This is not about women's nature being more open to deception than men, that the history makes a, a lie out of that suggestion. It's, it's mm -hmm. simply not true. Men are equally capable of being deceived. But in this particular case, even is, Eve is an example of somebody who not sufficiently instructed was deceived. And in fact, what Paul is doing is he's contrasting Eve with Mary because he goes on to say that a woman will be saved through the childbearing. Now, the childbearing is surely the birth of Jesus. So we have this contrast between Eve, who is deceived and sins, and Mary, who says, I am the handmaid in the Lord, be it unto me as you have said, and obeys God and leads to the salvation of the world through the giving of birth to Jesus. So I don't think that Paul is simply endorsing the theology of Jesus ben Sira. I think he has a much more nuanced approach to the problem without denying that Genesis 2 certainly blames Eve to some degree. But then when Paul really wants to talk about the fall, he mainly blames Adam 
in uh, Romans 5 and 1 Corinthians 15. Because after all, Adam was the one who got the commandment. And when we're thinking about this, I mean, Adam is right there with Eve at the tree in the story. Adam could have simply said to Eve, don't do that. Or he could have simply said to Eve, no, I'm not eating of that apple, whatever you've done. But that's not what happens, is it? So both Adam and Eve are blamed for this in, in the uh, curse that follows. Now, as for modern feminist theology, that's a whole gigantic spectrum of things, right? I mean, you've got everything from mildly egalitarian that wants to really ground itself in what the Bible really does say about men and women in Christ to uh, radical feminism. And uh, I, I don't think the Bible endorses radical feminist theology. Uh, I, I'll give you an example. <laughs> I was once invited to a conference in Washington, DC by a bunch of radical feminists who wanted to talk about the death of Jesus as an example of child abuse. That is, if Jesus's death was not absolutely necessary for the salvation of the world, and they assumed it wasn't, that if God could have done it some other way, well, then in what sense is God the Father a loving father of his son Jesus if he uh, required Jesus to go and die on a cross? So I was invited to a conference to talk about de the death of Jesus on a cross as an example of child abuse by the Heavenly Father. Now, that is what I would call radical feminism. And uh, that's absolutely an unbiblical way to look at the death of Jesus. So. Um, you know, you, there are all kinds of views of feminism. My personal view was, would be that the Bible outlines clearly uh, what kind of feminism is appropriate in a Christian setting and in the church, and, and, and we need to endorse that kind of feminism and not radical feminism. Thank you very much for that. Um, the next question, I think you have touched on a little bit uh, about this um, passage uh, from Sophia Chiptajaya. Can women take the position of leadership at the church? Well, you have to answer that, not just teaching, but to assume authority over men, considering 1 Timothy 2.12. Well, here's the thing. The authority that any minister has is not based on their gender, gender. It's based on whether God has anointed them and inspired them and endowed them with the ability to play that role. The authority they have doesn't have anything to do with whether they're male or female. It has to do whether they have been authorized by God to do that role. So yes, when women are authorized to be uh, apostles or preachers, or teachers, or whatever they're authorized to be, uh, they have the ability to exercise that authority over any member of the congregation. Of course, of course they do, because they're the pastor of that congregation, and that shouldn't be a problem at all. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Marlon Lahope. Um, thank you for your presentation, Dr. Witterington. I'm reading about the history of Christian theology. And as we all know that the history of Christianity was dominated by the rule of man. That's why we generally call the fathers of the church and not the mothers of the church. But as you have already explained that the New Testament has positive view on women in Christian ministry or the early church. My questions are first, did Paul or the apostles fail in their teaching to their followers, like the fathers of the church, on the role of women in the church? Second, how you reconcile the history of Christianity and New Testament views on the role of women in the church? Thank you. This is yet another excellent question. And uh, what I have to say is, um, it, it's a sad story. I don't think Paul and the earliest disciples failed because we certainly still have women playing a whole variety of roles into the second century of the church. But what did happen is that the, the more Gentile the church became, 
And the further away it got from its biblical roots in the Old Testament and then the forming of the New Testament, the more uh, culture took over. Uh, the general culture was patriarchal in character. And another factor was actually asceticism. This notion, which is not a Jewish notion at all, that the body is the prison house of the soul, and what really matters is your soul or your spirit. And this led to a particular view of what is called asceticism, that in order for you to be a genuine spiritual person, you had to be a non-sexual person. And uh, you can see that already in second century literature like the Acts of Paul and Thecla, where Thecla has to renounce really being a woman or getting married or having children in order to be a prophetess. And, and she's depicted as a person who has to abstain from all uh, sexual expression or, or even thinking about those kinds of things because that's a matter of uncleanness or even wickedness. Well, when you have the church becoming overwhelmingly Gentile and forgetting its Jewish good theology of the goodness of creation and the goodness of human sexuality, and when you add to that a sort of Gnostic way of looking at spirituality, which has to do with what you are uh, inside, but it doesn't have to do with the way you use your body or express your body and the goodness of human sexuality, well, then you're out, off to the races. And so what happens is the cultural captivity of the church beginning in the second century and going on through the fourth, fifth, and sixth centuries. But I would say that despite that, there were still women who were theologians and teachers and prophetesses throughout church history um, that, that you can look to and, and learn from, like Hildegard of Bingen, for example, who were important uh, persons, important voices. It wasn't just about the church fathers. There were also church mothers that we need to know about. Uh, and, and we need to know their stories and, and what they shared along the way. So um, I, I think that it's not Paul who failed. No, it's the overwhelmingly Gentile church that allowed the cultural agendas to come back into the church and dominate the church, beginning in the second and third and fourth centuries. Thank you. Yeah, um, uh, I think I need to ask the committee, is there any more questions? Because that's the, oh, sorry, there is another question. I thought that that was the last. Um, okay, is, the next one is from Rudy Pan. If Paul's statement is in 1 Timothy 2, 1 to 12 is to counter culture and open the possibility for women to teach, after proper, properly trained, why didn't Paul brought out creation order as his argument? I might have touched that one earlier. Yeah, well, that's a very good question. Uh, the reason he wanted to bring up the creation order is to contrast a woman who was improperly instructed and therefore was deceived and was guilty of, of bad actions as opposed to Mary, who received the teaching from the angel and responded properly. So it's not a question of him saying, women are deceived, uh, they're bad, they should never play these roles. No, he's contrasting one woman with another woman there who did respond properly to the world, to, to the Lord, and, and in fact became the mother of the Messiah. So th that's part of what's going on there. Uh, and so the appeal to the creation order was to say that women can either do it properly or improperly, but it's not a matter of gender. It's a matter of being properly instructed. So these high status women in Ephesus need to be properly instructed before they teach. Thank you. The next question um, is actually from anonymous uh, attendee. In Ephesians 5.22, it says that wives must submit to their husbands. My question is, does this wife's obedience have any limits? Or when the husband commits domestic violence and beats the wife, and the wife must still have to submit to the husband? Or 
what she should do. Yeah. But first of all, violence it is in no way acceptable behavior by a husband towards a wife. It's, it's anti-Christian behavior. And a wife should never have to submit to that. If she needs to separate from her husband uh, and, and then both of them get counseling or whatever it needs, to, whatever needs to be done, she is not required to behave in such a way that violates her own Christian principles. Absolutely not. The assumption in Ephesians 5, 21 and 22 is that everybody is behaving like a Christian. That's the assumption. And, and as I said before, and I cannot stress this enough, whatever the verb submit means in 521, where it says submit to one another out of reverence for Christ, both men to women and women to men, must be what it means in verse 22, because there is no verb in verse 22. It simply says wives to husbands as to the Lord. So what's carried over from verse 21 and 22 is the meaning of mutual submission. Mutual submission, not unilateral submission of wives to husbands. Thank you. Um, the next one is from Arum Kim. What would you say to people who say that women can teach and preach but cannot administer sacraments because the Levites had male priests and also Jesus himself was a man and thus the body of Christ should not be administered to or by women. Well, I'd say bless your heart. You've misread the Bible. Uh, we don't have a priesthood anymore. Jesus' sacrifice put an end to priesthoods of that sense. Uh, so the rules for the Levites and the priests were rules for a patriarchal society of a particular kind, and we are not living in that particular society. And uh, if Jesus authorized both women and men, which he did, to perform ministerial functions, there's no reason whatsoever that women shouldn't be able to serve the sacraments as well. Uh, it, it, again, it has nothing to do with gender. It has to do with who's been authorized and empowered by the Holy Spirit to serve the church in various functions. And there is no prohibition in the New Testament that says, uh, women, thou shalt not ever serve the sacraments. There's nothing like that in the New Testament. Thank you. Um... Sorry, I just tried to, oh yeah. So there is from another anonymous, sorry. Um, so uh, from Perdian, will you categorize Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Stanton or Elizabeth Fiorenza, a racial feminist? Oh, radical feminists. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, Caddy Staten was a, a feminist before her time and um, her rewriting of the Bible, uh, she was a lay person. She was not a scholar. She was a lay person. And uh, some of her ideas were all right and comported with the Bible. Uh, many of her uh, interpretations of the Bible were not in fact in line with what the Bible actually teaches. And, um, I have learned a lot from Elizabeth Schusler Fiorenza. I think she is a very creative theologian. Um, she came out of the Catholic Church, in fact, in Germany. And uh, I've learned a lot from her. Some of her teachings are just fine, and some go beyond what I think is biblically appropriate. So it's a mixed result with Fiorenza. Some of her more radical, more radical statements do not comport with biblical teaching. Thank you. Our next question is uh, from another anonymous attendee. Um, thank you, Ben, for your presentation. Your interpretation about women in New Testament is very interesting. However, when I read Luther's and Calvin's positions about women, 
I'm surprised that they interpreted verses about women in the scripture in a different way. For example, Luther said that Eve is not equal with Adam intellectually so that she fell into sin easily. Calvin said that women is the image of God in the second degree. They both rejected women's position in public ministry according to the interpretations of 1 Corinthians 14 and 1 Timothy 2. I can say that we Christians inherited many of our views nowadays from them. And although these views can be easily rejected in the modern days, it is also not easy to free ourselves from this traditional views. What do you think about this? Oh, I think you're right. It's not easy for us to uh, take off the robes of the, the Christian history of male dominance of women and just discard them. It's difficult because of course, I mean, Luther and Calvin as Protestants uh, offered us many positive, helpful teachings along the way of the Bible. Now they were dead wrong about this issue. They were absolutely wrong about this issue. They were simply replicating what they had grown up learning in their culture. And I would remind you that Luther had been an Augustinian monk before he became a reformer. And as such, he inherited the whole patriarchal structure of the Catholic Church. Uh, and that was still part of his thinking. Now he changed some of his thinking. He even married a nun, Katie von Bora. <laughs> so, so he was not exactly just endorsing everything he had learned in the, uh, as an Augustinian monk. But much of his views of women uh, along the way are, are simply unbiblical and degrading. For example, Martin Luther said, women are narrow at the shoulders and broad at the hips because uh, they're not meant to do the thinking for the church. They're meant to give birth to the babies. I mean, this is just, <laughs> this is very demeaning to women, not least because there are many women that are much more intelligent than men, much more well-educated than men. I mean, in, in making generalizations like that on the basis of gender just never works because it's not true in general of all men and all women. It just isn't. And uh, I would remind all of us that if we are a student of history, we'll know that 99% of all wars that have ever begun in human history were begun by men. And I would add that well over 90% of all domestic abuse of people in the family has been by men. And furthermore, 90% of all crime in human history have been by men. This is men behaving badly. And unfortunately, Martin Luther and John Calvin were, were both men behaving badly in regard to these particular matters. Thank you. Um, the next question is from Deborah Pugianti. It's again about First Timothy 2. It seems that this passage is like the highlight in this lecture is over and over again. And um, I think I just read it to you and then I think you have uh, answered the first one. If you if your interpretation of First Timothy 2 concerning Paul not permitting a woman to teach or to exercise authority over a man is only temporary because of the cult in the Ephesus culture, what do you think Paul goes back to the creation and the fall and use it as the reason of his prohibition. That's the first one. And the second one, in the first 14, isn't it clear that Paul said that Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived and become transgressors? Am I wrong in interpreting what you said when you said that the fall was Adam's fault? Well, here is clearly stated that it is Eve's fault. Well, again, I would say that Romans 5 is clear that the main responsibility for the fall is Adam. Go back and read Romans 5, 12 to uh, the end of the chapter. And that's very clear. It's also clear that when Paul wants to contrast the beginning of the human race with Christ, it, he contrasts Adam with Christ, not Eve. 
So go back and read Romans 5. That's pretty clear. The reason, again, for Paul highlighting the example of Eve is twofold. A, because there was a danger of these uh, socially elite women assuming roles in the church before they were ready to teach and being deceived about what was the proper Christian teaching or how to go about offering that kind of teaching. And Paul wanted them fully and, and finally instructed by those who were already the authorized teachers in the setting in Ephesus before they went off and taught people. And I would add that later in the pastoral epistles, we hear about women teaching other women, for example. So it, this is not a general prohibition of women teaching in the church at all. And so the, the reason to appeal to the example of Eve it is because the women in Ephesus were in danger of behaving like Eve. They hadn't been properly instructed and, and therefore uh, they, they were in danger of offering misleading teaching before they'd been properly instructed. So that's really what's going on there. Thank you. This is the last question. Um, if the husband is to treat his wife as Christ does to the church, does that mean he should govern all the details of her life and that she should clear all her actions with him? No. Look what it says. It says Christ self-sacrificially serves the church and gave up his life for her. This is not about the husband governing the wife. It's about the husband serving the wife the same way Christ self-sacrificially served the church. Thank you very much, um, Dr. Witherington, for your time and for your insightful uh, lecture. Um, so I think right now I just um, give the time to the committee if there's anything else that um, the committee want to say. Well, I'm glad we were able to connect. I, you know, the time difference is difficult to figure out. And so I'm glad I got an extra email saying you need to be on now instead yeah, of Yeah, that's right. So, we are so grateful that you are here. I, 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 I say thank you, Yosefat, uh, that we got this done. <laughs> yes, it's become the daylight, uh, daylight uh, saving time is quite tricky in figuring that out. I understand. Yeah. I really understand. But anyway, may I just say Merry Christmas to all and may the Lord bless you and keep you. And as you're thinking about this issue, I would say, uh, Commit the whole of yourself to the text. Commit the whole of the text to yourself. And I think you will see that what I'm sharing with you is fully biblical and does honor to the sacred worth of both women and men who are called to serve the church. Thank you so very much for that. All right. Bye. And have a blessed day. Bye. Merry Christmas to you too. Bye bye. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Whittington. I think he's gone already. Oh, he's gone already. Okay, thank you. Yeah, uh, actually, we would like to give our appreciation to Dr. Witherington for his service to us uh, this evening. He has given us the very good lectures about women. And we also, in this uh, opportunity, also, we would like to express our uh, gratitude also to Buinawati Teddy, who becomes the translator. Thank you, Buina, for your best support so far for Tutola Scriptura. You make these lectures more accessible to participants who have some limitation in the language. So they can also follow these uh, lectures in Indonesian language that you translate. And last but not least, we would like also to say thanks, to give thanks to Chakrita, who become the moderator for this evening lecture. Thank you very much for your role to enrich the discussion and to lead uh, us in the question and answer. May God, may God bless you all. Uh, before we leave the, we close the meeting, I, uh, I would like to 
announce uh, several things first regarding the evaluation for this uh, lectures we would like your participation for all the participants to fill in the evaluation form that has been sent via chat room or via whatsapp group so uh, please uh, give us your feedback so we can do it uh, better in the next time for the next time and the second thing uh, I would like also to inform you that this uh, lectures will be uploaded uh, later on in Sola Scriptura YouTube channel. So you you can still uh, watch this again at uh, Sola Scriptura YouTube channel. And uh, the next, I would like also to introduce some books, uh, some good books. Yeah, this is uh, these are the some uh, good books uh, published by Perkantas Jatim. You can uh, you can get uh, some information here. This is uh, the first book is about the perspective, and this is the second book, the case for Grace by Grace by Lee Strober. You can buy the book uh, to their website or to through all the online shop uh, mentioned uh, below. Okay, and the last thing, uh, as we uh, in from, from Solar Scriptura schedule the, this kind of like online lecture in every three months. So hopefully we can uh, meet again uh, on March 2021 for our next webinar or next online lectures. We will uh, give you all the details uh, by, uh, by end of February for the, our next webinar. So now we would like to close our webinar in prayer. I would like to ask uh, Bapak Dr. John Riaman Sipayung from STT Abdi Sabda, Medan, to close us in prayer, Pak. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your grace in enabling us to meet and to hear one another by this Zoom webinar. We thank you, Lord, for sending Dr. Ben with Harrington, who shared the gospel, especially in elaborating the rural women in the New Testament. We learned a nice thing deeply, especially in treating people in equal level. Our Lord, through this meeting, encourage us to love and to empower male and female in uh, your ministry in equal positions. Lord, bless the committees, bless the speaker and all the participants who joined in this evening. May through this webinar, we can uh, see that uh, all the human beings are equal in front of you, even though we have a different functions. But thank you, Lord, for your enabling us to know each other and to hear the lesson from uh, Ben. All this, we hope that can be a glory to your name and we can share and witness the gospel through our all position in this world. Thank you, Lord. We hope that in some times we can meet again and we pray in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Pa John. Okay, uh, dear brother and sister, we will meet again next March. We usually do it on the first week of, uh, of the month. So first week, March on Friday. Thank you again.